Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where in the world you are. I'm Lisa Berkeley, and this is the Charter for Compassion, uh, the MLK 40 Days of Peace. And um, we have with us today, uh, Ratsu, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Ray Matsumiyama and Steve Lieber, who we will be having a, a conversation and a presentation about why Martin Luther King Day is celebrated in Hiroshima, Japan. Before we begin, I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first, uh, this event is being recorded. And then second, for those who are with us live, if you'll notice down in your control bar, um, there's a Q&A section and also a chat section. You can feel free during the presentation if you have any questions to pop them in there. Um, the order that we'll be working in is we'll be having a presentation and then the Q&A will be afterwards. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the uh, charter. The Charter for Compassion was established in about 2009 from Karen Armstrong's TED Talk when she had done research looking at what is the unifying theme of the world's religions and discovered compassion to be that theme. And her wish with her TED Talk prize money was that all of the world's uh, religious leaders would come together and write a document of which people could sign that exemplified and modeled and that was a call to action for compassion. And from there, eventually the Charter for Compassion was born. Currently, we have actually over 405 cities uh, and communities across the globe with um, a total of 629 total populations of these cities and 39 a number of metro areas with over 2 million populations. So the, the Charter for Compassion really is a very large um, community across the globe. And um, that's one of the things we're gonna be discussing here today. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speakers. Um, and I'm gonna introduce for you. First, we have um, Steve Lieber, who was born in Urbana, Illinois in 1947. His careers include family counselor, management consultant, translator, and peace activist. Close to half of his life has been spent in Japan. And then in 2002, he began working as a US representative for Mayors for Peace, which led to the appointment of chairman of the Hiroshima Peace Culture Foundation which houses Hiroshima's Peace and International Relations Program, including the Peace Memorial Museum and the Secretariat of Mayors for Peace. In 2008, Steve led a program to hold 101 A-bomb exhibitions in the US. In 2009, he won the fiscal year 2008 uh, Academia Prize in International Exchange from Academic Society of Japan in Kyoto. Then in 2014, Steve moved, moved to a farm uh, Konu Cho, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, to begin building the Peace Culture Village or PCV. He currently lives half the year in Konu and half in Atlanta, Georgia, where he writes and lectures on peace while working for the Peace Culture Village. And that you'll see that um, photograph behind him but he'll share more of that a little bit later. So Steve has translated and interpreted hundreds of talks, articles, and books by A-bomb survivors. He's a visiting professor at Hiroshima Jogakun University and Nagasaki University. He's published books, including Hiroshima Resolution, which is bilingual, Nyo ga sekai wo suku, Japanese. Please, for any Japanese watchers, I'm sorry, I'm not a Japanese speaker. I hope Pretty that good. I yeah, okay, good, good. I, and America Jin Ga Chitsutsuaru Hiroshima. I hope we didn't just jinx it on that. <laughs> well, welcome, Steve. And then Thank with you. us with us also, we have Ray uh, Matsunia. Did I hope I pronounced that? Was that was correct. Okay. Yeah is the director of the Cambridge, Massachusetts-based Oleander Initiative that gathers peace builders from around the world to Hiroshima, Japan for life-changing programs and study tours. He inspired by a mother from Hiroshima, Ray has devoted his professional career to unofficial diplomacy, cross-cultural exchange and peace building. Over the past 20 years, he supervised programs for over uh, 2,500 educators and civil society leaders in the US, Japan, Spain, and nine Middle Eastern North African countries. His programs have been featured in the New York Times, Boston Globe, uh, El Pai, 
and PBS via NHK World. Ray's been an invited, TED, uh, invited TEDx speaker at the Massachusetts State House, the Dayton International Peace Museum, the US Embassy of Tunis, and in universities such as the Sloan School at MIT and the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He's had pieces published in USA Today and Inkstick Media. Ray received his master's degree from the Fletcher School at Tufts University and his BA from Wesleyan University. He is a certified mediator. He is also fluent in English and proficient in Japanese and Levant Arabic. Welcome, Ray. Hey, um, hey. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so very happy to have you both here with me. And um, why don't we just go ahead and, and jump in. And I do wanna just say that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is part of the Charter for Compassion's um, 40 days of MLK, which began on MLK day and will conclude at the end of February. So. You'll see if you go to the Charter's website, um, other, other events focused on MLK. So thank you, let's just jump in. Hey, thank you so much, Lisa. And it's really a great pleasure for me to be here today. I'm also, uh, it's also a great pleasure for me to be co-presenting with Steve, who's really been my mentor and friend for the last few years. Um, the reason why we're here today is that we're gonna talk about why, I'm gonna share my screen, why Martin Luther King Day is celebrated in Hiroshima. If you look at this globe, we know that Martin Luther King Day is celebrated all around the United States. It's also celebrated in Toronto, Canada as well. But the only other place in the entire world that MLK Day is celebrated and officially recognized and observed is Hiroshima, Japan. So why is that? You know, Hiroshima is thousands of miles away from the United States it only became an observed holiday about 20 years ago. So on one clue might be the connection between Hiroshima and MLK, the man himself. We know that Martin Luther King had an admiration for Japan. He recognized the suffering that the Japanese people went through in World War II, and especially the people of Hiroshima who were the first victims of a nuclear weapon. He also was a great admirer of the reconciliation that happened between Japan and America after the war and the commitment to pacifism by the Japanese government. It's within their constitution that Japan is a pacifist country. You can see this, you can see this letter from on December 1967 where uh, Martin Luther King really expressed a great desire to go to Japan. And it's really unfortunate that he, he never made it over there because just four months afterwards, he was, he was assassinated. Another clue comes from MLK's stance against nuclear weapons. You can see from the quote below that he was really a great proponent of abolishing nuclear weapons. And it's been recorded that he often had nightmares about the end of the world ending in, in nuclear fire. Just one week before he was assassinated, he had one of these dreams. But I think the quote that really connects uh, MLK and Hiroshima together is this one. He says, we must see that peace represents a sweeter music, a cosmic melody that is far superior to the discords of war. And this connection may seem funny at first because for most people, this is what Hiroshima is known for. It's known as uh, the victim of the first atomic weapon. And that's where the knowledge of most people's uh, of, of Hiroshima uh, ends. But most people don't understand the unbelievable story that came after the bomb during the rebuilding process. And what happened was that Hiroshima devoted every single part of its society, uh, its government, its educational system, its culture to rebuild Hiroshima from something called, a, that, that was something that was called a, a burn scar after the, the bomb into a city of peace. They rebuilt themselves in, in the image of peace. So Hiroshima is really a city that dedicated itself in spreading that sweet music of peace that Dr. King talked about, not just within the city, but all around the world. So what we hope you get out of this presentation today is a kind of like an understanding of this very unique peace culture that lives and breathes in, in Hiroshima and how a man who committed himself to nonviolence and pacifism and equality uh, makes total sense for this man's day to be celebrated in Hiroshima. 
So I'm going, uh, I'm sorry, there's uh, five different parts to this presentation. The first is what happened on August 6th, 1945? What happened when the first atomic weapon was used against human beings in Hiroshima? Part two will cover this really unique and amazing peace culture that grew out of this tragedy and how over the last 75 years it, it got established and grew. Part three, we'll talk about specifically how Martin Luther King Day got to Hiroshima. And we're very lucky to have Steve here because he personally knows and worked with the man that was responsible for this to happen. Uh, we're gonna conclude with our, uh, our work in Hiroshima. We do both online programs and in-person programs in Hiroshima. We take advantage of this very special platform and feeling that happens in Hiroshima for our peace work. We'll conclude with a question and answer session. So now it's really a great honor for me to pass it on to Steve Leeper, who will talk specifically about what happened on August 6th, 1945. Thank you, Ray. And thank you, Lisa and the Charter for Compassion. I'm really happy to be a part of this event. Uh, what I'm going to do is take you through the first few slides of my Google Earth presentation. <clears throat> I've used this with audiences in Pennsylvania, Hawaii, Japan, various places in Japan, England, South Africa, and Rwanda. Last year, and so far this year, visitors have not been able to come to Hiroshima. So we take Hiroshima to them. The tour I'm giving today is just a, a taste of what we can do. And I, I'm also trying to help you understand why Hiroshima became as peace-oriented as it is. I begin in Tinian Island, and I, here I talk about the Americans and their attitude toward the bombing. Then we fly over to Hiroshima, and here I talk about the size and the shape of Hiroshima. It's on a delta, and why it was selected. Uh, the Hiroshima is on a delta, and, and it was estimated very accurately to be just about the size of a city that the bomb could destroy. Hiroshima was a military headquarters, but did not have a prisoner of war camp. It has an unusually high percentage of sunny days in August. It's easy to fly in and out of, no big mountains around it, in front of it anyway. And it has this nice T-shaped bridge right in the middle of it uh, that made a good target. I'll show you that in just a minute. Here we go to seeing Hiroshima from the bomber, the, this is the bomber. This is what the bombardier was looking at. And here is the T-shaped bridge. I hope you can see my cursor. They were aiming at that bridge and they missed it by 240 yards. Now, let me show you what was happening to Hiroshima or in Hiroshima when the bomb was dropped. Hiroshima was a bustling city. In fact, it was one of the most prosperous in Japan at the time because it was so involved with the military. And I always show this to make sure that everyone knows that there were real people living there, living real lives. But we won't go through all that. I'm trying to save some time here. Next, I go to the hypocenter. And here is the bridge, the famous T-shaped Ioi bridge that was the target. And here is actually where the bomb exploded. And it exploded 600 meters in the sky above this point right here. And I'll skip the technical details of the bomb that I sometimes get into here. This is the area that is now Peace Park. It's called, it was called Nakajima at the time. And um, there were 4,400 people officially living here, but it was a central commercial district. So we have no idea how many people were actually there because a lot of people were just shopping at 8.15 on Monday morning. And now what I'd like you to do is please close your eyes and think about what you would be doing. What, you, what are you normally doing at 8.15 in the morning? And then please listen to these sounds from Hiroshima.
Now, please open your eyes. And this is that same place that you were just looking at. And this is what was left after the bombing. In fact, this is what was left of the area about 500 meters in diameter. So half a mile in all directions looked about like this. 96% of all the people in that area died immediately or within a few days. As far as I know, there was only one person who survived in this Peace Park area and he was in the basement of this very strong building that was the fuel hall at the time of the bombing. He was in, down in the basement and shielded. The, the A-bomb museum is organized in this order, heat, blast, fire, and radiation. This is the order that they initially uh, believed things happened, but actually we found out later that radiation comes first. If you were within half a mile and unshielded, you got a lethal dose of neutron radiation during the one millionth of a second before the start, uh, between the start of the chain reaction and the explosion. When the bomb exploded, it gener generated a tremendous flash of heat and light. Within one second, the fireball was 300 to 400 meters in diameter. This raised the temperature on the ground right below it to 3,000 to 4,000 degrees for about three seconds. Iron melts at about 2,800 degrees. This ball of fire created a supersonic blast and a wind that blew at about 1,000 miles an hour. The strongest tornado ever measured had winds of about 300 miles per hour. The blast turned everything that moved into a bullet. Glass shattered and flew through the air. People within a mile or so also flew through the air. The heat ignited anything flammable. Charcoal and gas breakfast fires were also released. So within 15 or 20 minutes, all of downtown was a sea of fire. In an hour or so, the fire expanded out to 1.2 miles, burning everything comb combustible in that radius. The city burned all day and all night. This was a true firestorm, which means it created its own weather. It created whirlwinds strong enough to lift people into the air. Later, radioactive particles in the air fell as oily black rain. If you were within 1.2 miles, in order to survive, you had to be shielded from the flash and radiation. You also had to be shielded from the blast and all the glass and junk flying through the air. Then you had to be able to get away from whatever structure was shielding you, and you had to be able to walk or be carried out beyond 1.2 miles of fire. In March 1945, 300 bombers attacked Tokyo, dropping thousands of bombs. That attack killed over 100,000 people, and the total destructive power was about the equivalent of 1,800 tons of TNT. The Hiroshima bomb was equal to about 15,000 tons. One plane dropped 10 times more destructive power than 300 planes did previously. And the Hiroshima bomb was a toy compared to the bombs we have now. Nuclear weapons represent an entirely new, unimaginable level of destruction. They are literally a doomsday machine. And that's why the UN General Assembly adopted the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which has now been signed by 81 countries and ratified by 51. It goes into force today and its message is simple. The non-nuclear states are saying to the nuclear armed nations, you have no right under any circumstances whatsoever to destroy human civilization and maybe kill all of us. We declare your weapons illegal. Okay, I turn it back to you, Ray. You are muted, Ray. So Steve talked about kind of like an above ground view of the atomic bomb. So now I want to talk about what happened underneath the mushroom cloud from that bomb. And this part means a lot to me because 
uh, my personal connection to this is really strong. My grandfather, uh, Yoshio Chuchioka, was there on the day of the nuclear attack. He lived in a village uh, a few miles outside of the city in Kure. And it was a very rural town. And on that morning of August 6th, 1945, people from his village started running up to his house and telling him that something awful had happened in Hiroshima, but no one could quite explain what, what it was. My grandfather knew that he had to go because he was the captain of the volunteer fire department. So he started gathering his men and getting his truck ready to go help the victims inside of the, inside of the city. Right before he left the house, my grandmother stopped him. And what you don't understand about my grandmother is that she was someone that absolutely loved food. She loved feeding her five kids. Whenever there was a festival in her village, she was the one that, that did the cooking. So for her, food was at the center of her universe. So that's why to her, it made sense to give my grandfather four umusubis or rice balls. Because in her universe, in the centrality of food within it, there's nothing that couldn't be made a little bit better through food. So my grandfather took those four musubis, put them in his pack, and started going down the highway towards Hiroshima. And I can't imagine how he felt when he, when he, when he arrived there. And I can't imagine how he felt when he started treating the victims there. And he tried to give some of the musubis to the victims, but he realized that they only wanted two things. The first was water. They were so thirsty from the radiation poisoning. And the second thing, whether there are soldiers or civilians or men or women or elderly people or, or, or little kids, they all asked for their mothers before they passed. So on what must have been the longest day of my grandfather's life, he entered into Hiroshima with four Muslims and he went back out with four Muslims. About a week later, he felt a strange pain in his left eye. And about a week after that, he lost it from the radiation that he was exposed to. But he never forgot what that eye had seen. And for the rest of his life, he was talked about the three lessons of Hiroshima that he learned from that terrible day. The first was to forgive, but never forget. He actually forgave the Americans for doing this. Uh, so much so they let his daughter, my mother, move to Boston and, and, and live here for the rest of her life. But he never forgot the suffering of the people of Hiroshima. The second thing that he learned was resiliency. He actually became an optimist after this because he realized that people always go forwards despite the adversity that they face. And to do that, you had to let go of some of the sorrow and the, and the, and the terror and the, and the feelings of revenge and move towards the future to go forwards. And third is probably the most important. He thought it was, a, it was the responsibility of every single human being on earth to make sure what happened to his city would never happen again. That it was everyone's responsibility to promote peace. So my grandfather's known uh, as, as someone, uh, as a, is known as a hibakusha, or a victim of the, of the atomic bomb. And the three lessons that he took out of Hiroshima weren't unusual. In fact, many hibakusha echo the very same sentiments. And this is an article from Time Magazine 15 years ago during the 60th anniversary of the bomb that really uh, moved me. And in this, they asked uh, victims of the hibakusha what is your message to future generations? And this is what some of them said. So you can see an amazing commonality in the message of almost all the Hibakusha that speak publicly is, is, is that they, they all wholeheartedly promote peace. This is my friend Ishida-san who lives in Hiroshima. And he lost his grandparents to the atomic bomb. 
And he told me that for many, many years, he burned with anger against the Americans. And that changed when he became a father. And he looked down and he saw this beautiful baby in his, hand, in his arms. And he realized, and he told me that the choice was very clear. He could either be stuck in the past with his grandparents, wrapped up in anger and feelings of revenge, or he could look towards the future and make sure what happened to his grandparents would never happen to his son. So he really devoted his life to peace. So you can see the message of the Hibakusha is not about anger at the United States, victimhood or revenge. It's really a worldwide message for peace. And this is something I don't quite understand myself being an American is how they were able to channel all those feelings, all those terrible feelings into something bigger than themselves into this amazing message of peace. And it's really a tribute to them. You can see how early these feelings of peace came about. This is a newspaper article from May, 1946. This is less than one year after the bomb killed 140,000 people. But the citizens of Hiroshima created this peace tower. Once again, it wasn't a, a tower of revenge or sorrow or anger, or it was a tower for peace. And this is less than one year after the dropping of the atomic bomb. The wishes of the people of Hiroshima uh, were, were respected by the government. And in August, 1949, the Hiroshima government officially passed the Peace Memorial Reconstruction Act that made a conscious de decision to rebuild Hiroshima in the image of peace. And for many years, political power in Hiroshima was directly tied to a peace platform. I mean, can you imagine that uh, being in this country? That, that uh, political power was directly in line with the candidate's wishes for peace. And these are four uh, former mayors of Hiroshima. And the man on the, on the bottom left is Mayor Akiba. And he's the one that's responsible for bringing Martin Luther King Day to, to, um, to Hiroshima. And we're really, as I said before, we're, we're really lucky to have Steve Leeper here because he worked with Mayor Akiba uh, in the city of Hiroshima. He was the first non-Japanese person to do so in the history of this office. So I'm gonna pass this over to you, Steve. Oh, you're muted, Steve. Oh. Thank you. Uh, all four of those mayors were reading peace declarations. This peace declaration is a uh, is part of the ceremony that takes place on August sixth, when the whole city remembers and the whole park fills up with people remembering uh, what happened on August sixth. Uh, the Mayors for Peace was created in 1982 as a campaigning arm of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They fund it together, but the Secretariat is in Hiroshima's Peace Culture Foundation. The original idea was a protest. Hiroshima and Nagasaki decided that if countries are not going to ban nuclear weapons, cities will have to do it. But in the first 20 years, all they did was hold a conference every four years. So they only got about 500 city members. To become a member, a mayor has to sign the quote, program to promote the total abolition of nuclear weapons. So you have to take a stand against the nuclear weapons, but that's all you have to do. Well, oh, the other thing is the mayor has to do this on behalf of his city. So the members are cities, not mayors. When the mayor stops being mayor and someone else comes in, the city remains a member unless the mayor takes an action to stop being a member. Mayor Akiba was very quick to see that this network of city had a lot more potential. He became mayor in 1999. He hired me in 2001 and another American activist in 2002. Then in late 2002, we, the Mayors for Peace and uh, the city of Hiroshima launched the 2020 vision campaign in Nagasaki. Our declared goal was a treaty banning nuclear weapons by 2020. But our first task was to expand Mayors for Peace membership and raise our profile. 
we started with 500 mayors. But after launching the 2020 vision campaign, we were soon getting 500 new city members each year. By the time Akiba stepped down as mayor in 2011, we had over 5,000 members. Today, we have nearly 8,000 cities in 164 countries. Mayor Akiba was unusual in many ways. First, he was the first post-bombing mayor who was not himself a hibaksha or a survivor. Another difference is that he was a peace activist before he got into politics. That happened because he went to the US as a foreign exchange student. And he was extremely frustrated because his English wasn't good enough to argue with the Americans who were happy about the Hiroshima bombing and the fact that the US has nuclear weapons. As a result, he learned English so well that even as he was studying math at Tokyo University, he became a simultaneous interpreter. He is completely bilingual and bicultural and a citizen of the world, not just Japan. He went to MIT, where he got a PhD in mathematics in only three years. He taught at the University of New York Stony Brook, then at Tufts University. And so he was in the United States for a total of 18 years. Then he came back to Hiroshima in 1986 to teach at Shudo University. While doing that, he was elected to the Diet and, and represented Hiroshima there, and he served from 1990 to 1999. In 1998, I was among a group of peace activists who went to his office to talk him into running for mayor in 1999. He did run, he won, and served for 12 years. He was an excellent mayor. He fought corruption and insisted on fair and open bidding for all government jobs. He also fought pollution and made Hiroshima's rivers swimmable after years of being dirty and smelly. In working for Mayors for Peace, Akiba visited many of America's major cities to ask the mayors there in person to join and also to develop economic ties. He visited Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and DC, of course, but he made a special point of visiting Atlanta. For Atlanta, he organized a tree exchange. When he came here, he brought a bunch of cherry tree seedlings. In return, Mayor Campbell did join Mayors for Peace and he gave Hiroshima a large number of dogwood seedlings. I'm not sure what happened to the cherry trees, but I know that we now have 600 Atlanta dogwoods growing along the Kiyobashi River in Hiroshima. Akiba went to Atlanta because he understood and deeply respected the legacy of Martin Luther King. He was well aware of the civil rights movement and he felt deeply that King was a kindred spirit. He often spoke of King in his speeches and he made it clear that King's beloved community and Hiroshima's peace culture are essentially the same. The devastating obliteration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki convinced the people of those cities that we must absolutely never allow a nuclear war. That led them to understand that to be safe from nuclear war, we have to give up war altogether. And that led them to their own independent strain of nonviolence. The peace culture we talk about in Hiroshima is not as Christian as King's, and it derives more from a negative imperative. That is, we have to learn to get along with each other in order to survive. But it arrives at the same place. We have to work for justice and equality and caring for all. King said, it's no longer a choice between violence and nonviolence in this world. It's nonviolence or non-existence. This is the essence of Hiroshima's message. Back to you, Ray. Hey, thank you, Steve. So Hiroshima peace culture isn't just in the government. It's really important for the people of, uh, for the people of Hiroshima to also be educated in peace culture as well. So that's why the educational system in Hiroshima is the only one in the world that makes it legally mandatory for there to be peace education in every single level of education, starting from nursery school all the way to senior year in high school. And you can see from this chart that it goes from uh, the self all the way to the world. So each um, curriculum item becomes bigger and bigger. 
So Ray, I'm sorry to interrupt you a little bit, but on that slide, it was really hard for people to read. I don't know if you wanted everyone to be able to read it thoroughly, but can you just give a little bit overview of, of more of that slide? Uh, sure. Um, it just shows um, how the PEACE curriculum is implemented in each level of education, starting from nursery school all the way to senior year in high school. So uh, in nursery school, they on the younger levels, they really um, focus on, on yourself and yourself to others. And it's kind of like a uh, increasingly larger concentric circle of care, starting from yourself all the way to the rest of the world. So I wanted to show you what happens in kindergarten. So this is uh, the morning peace song at the Motomachi school in Hiroshima. And, they, and the kids sing this every single day. And it's really, really cute. So, so here we go. So that's uh, kindergarten uh, in, in Hiroshima. I think one of the most uh, inspiring things about Hiroshima is that it's an example of mainstream peace, which means that peace really permeates every single part of the society. You can just see this just walking around on the city. The main museum is Peace Memorial Museum. The main park that really dominates Hiroshima is Peace Memorial Park. The main street is called Peace Boulevard. The main, the main bridge is Peace Bridge. You can kind of see where I'm going with this. It's also been somewhat commercialized as well. So you can uh, stay at the Peace Hotel and then eat lunch at the Peace Cafe, get a snack off the street, a Peace snack off the street, go to a Peace bathhouse, uh, get on a bike from a Peace bike ride chair and get your nails done at the One Piece Nail Salon. So in many ways, Hiroshima is really the living embodiment of peace, nonviolence, and, and really like the optimism and the good of people, which are so many of MLK's core values. So uh, our last part of our presentation covers uh, the actual culture of peace that lives in Hiroshima and why it's so good to run peace building programs there. So I think the most important factor in doing peace programs in Hiroshima is that it is one of the most optimistic places that you can think of. It's, it's really counterintuitive, but Hiroshima is, is an extremely optimistic place. And if you bring people from conflict zones, a lot of times it's hard for them to see past the terrible present that their communities are in from, from conflict. But if you bring them to Hiroshima, they'll see uh, the amazing transformation and the benefits of peace. So this is Hiroshima in 1945, and this is Hiroshima today. And you can see that it's a city built on peace. So it really shows the concrete benefits of peace to participants on, who may not be able to see that. And in our, and in our experience, on really optimism is really the key factor to help participants move towards reconciliation. Uh, the other, another, another factor is the environment. Uh, many of you know about the Oslo process or the Dayton peace process. And the basic premise for these peace processes were to take combatants out of their uh, homes and the communities, transport them to somewhere uh, beautiful. In, 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 uh, in Norway, uh, in Oslo, uh, a group of uh, Israeli and Palestinian academics got together in these beautiful woods. And because of the environment and, and the, the nice environment there, they were able to hash out the Oslo Peace Accords. But Hiroshima is like Oslo, but on steroids. Not only is it a beautiful place, it's a place where the entire society is basically yelling at you to create peace. So the environment is an amazing factor in our programs. Uh, lastly, I think there's a lot of emotional resonance. 
especially from the hibakusha the, or the survivors of the bomb. So if you have uh, a hibakusha that tells you that you know, her entire family was killed by the Americans by this nuclear weapon, but she's forgiven them and moved on to try to, and promoting world peace. And for you uh, that came to Hiroshima to do the same thing, it's really a powerful emotional engine that helps our participants promote peace in their own communities. Uh, both me and Steve do in-person programs and online programs. So uh, I think we've, between us, we've brought maybe uh, participants from around 15 different countries to on um, our programs in Hiroshima and right outside of Hiroshima as well. Steve actually owns um, a country house and participants can experience peace culture within the city of Hiroshima, but also experience peace culture in the countryside through his organization, Peace Culture Village. And we do both do uh, online on uh, tour, virtual tours of Hiroshima. And on um, we, uh, recently we implemented a three uh, session module on um, that lasts for about uh, four and a half hours uh, on the theme of resilience. So that's the end of our uh, presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please contact me and Steve if you're interested in either going to Hiroshima in person, hopefully when the pandemic, when the pandemic ends, or are interested in engaging in some of our online programs. So thank you. Mm. Wow, that was incredibly powerful. Thank you so much for, um, for sharing that with us. Um, I just feel like I, I wanna take a second. Um, the, the experience you gave us of hearing the sound, I, that, um, that is incredibly powerful. You know, you can read about and you can see the photographs, but you gave such a visceral experience. I mean, I, I still feel like I'm rattled to my core a little bit from that. And then of course the sound and then with the stories, what a powerful presentation, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just take a quick look here to see if anybody has any specific questions. Um, Steve, you did mention that um, today is, is a very important day as it's officially uh, for those who have ratified the, the, the treaty that um, as of today, nuclear weapons are illegal. And um, Marla Slavner, Slavner um, put an article in the chat for, about that. And then also uh, Terry Provence said, Martin Luther King Jr. gave one of his most important speeches on April 4th, 1967 called Breaking Silence, Opposing Militarism, Racism and in Inequity. On the same date, April 4th, he was assassinated in 1968 a coalition of peace and justice groups is calling for local readings of the speech everywhere between April 1st and April 5th in 2021. A new website is being constructed, kingandbreakingsilence.org. So please join, uh, this is Terry's request that you please join again, that's kingandbreakingsilence.org. And then he asks that you go ahead and um, contact him at terryprovence at gmail.com. T-E-R-R-Y-P-R-O-V-A-N-C-E -E at gmail.com. Great. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that they're doing that. And uh, I assume that there is a translation of that speech in Japanese so we can read it in Hiroshima. Oh, that would be terrific. So I have a few few notes. I'm going to give other uh, participants chances to um, raise their hand or... Um, put questions in the chat or Q&A. And then um, Ray put uh, his contact information. So if you'd like to learn more, they put that on the slide, but I will also um, just say it out loud. If you'd like to re reach out to Ray, he's at Ray, R-A-Y, Matt, M-A-T, at U-M-E dot org. Or if you'd like to reach out to Steve, he's at Steve at peaceculturevillage.org. Um, so that's uh, where we go from here. So, you know, one of the things I was really touched on in the presentation was the transformation of revenge. 
that you spoke about. And um, I'm reminded of one of MLK's quotes, which says, um, man must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Hmm. And I, um, I'm touched by that quote as I'm touched by the, the transformation that Hiroshima did. And I'm, I'm curious, linguistically or culturally, if there's a, in, in Western culture, U.S. culture, um, the peace and love are not necessarily simultaneous. And so I'm wondering in Japanese or Japanese culture, if there's a difference or what that looks like. Can you speak to that? It may be a little of an esoteric question, but well, let me, let me first say one thing that um, came up for me when Ray was talking, and that is, I think it's very important to understand that many of the survivors knew immediately when this happened, that this was at an entirely different dimension from the war between Japan and America, mm -hmm. that this rose to the level of a threat to all of humanity. They could see that, that if, if we were to have wars with this kind of weapon, that would be the end of us. So that is part of why they abandoned revenge and, and um, they turned their hatred from America to war in general and specifically the atomic bomb and nuclear weapons. And they are, uh, they, all, almost all here, um, the survivors are very intense about we have to join hands. We have to solve our, um, our, all of our conflicts peacefully through dialogue and negotiation, and we cannot fight. And this comes from a real deep existential fear, an existential understanding that that is the only way we're going to survive. You know, I, you know, growing up here in America, I, I don't quite understand it myself, so like the transformation of revenge. And I, and I, asked, I asked my mother once, I was like, why did you move here to Boston, you know, after, you know, you grew up in, a, in this place, right, where you saw all this, all the suffering caused by, by America. And she said that, and it, echo, it echoes a lot of Steve's themes where people recognize it as almost like a mystical event, that it was something super, it was, it was something bigger than themselves. And she said that that suffering was so large that, and this goes to your Japanese, uh, the, the Japanese language question. She said that you have to nagasu. Nagasu in Japanese means you have to let it like kind of flow down the river. Because if you hold mm -hmm. on to that, like it, it'll consume you. And, and it's so big that it'll, it'll eat you up. So unless you nagasu and let it go down the river, it's hard to just keep moving, moving forwards in life. And a lot of people learn how to do that. And to their credit, what was amazing is that the way they moved on was to promote peace, to make it something very constructive, to not just you know, put it away. They did something constructive with that sorrow and, and horror. And I, and I think that's what makes Hiroshima so special and the people there are so special. Yeah, interesting. I like your word choice of, of the, the, you have to eat it. And, and I was reflecting on, again, the story of your grandparents and the mother, your grandmother with the rice. But I, I digress with that for a moment. But um, uh, back I, to your question about love and peace. Yeah. The word for love that's officially the word for love is I. And that is not um, talked about all that much. It's a mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a low profile word and it has mostly to do with interpersonal love. But the word that's very commonly used is jihi. And jihi is the word for com compassion. So you are, you with the charter for compassion are right in line with, I guess, Japanese culture, which sees that um, peace, peace goes with compassion or, and in fact, it has to be built on compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That uh, was going to be my next question is, is where, how does this tie into compassion? You just answered it. How wonderful. Um, so we, we have a, uh, only about like a little less than 10 minutes left, but um, there have been some questions about if you can talk about the programs that you offer a little bit more in Hiroshima. Um, and, but hold on, I see I missed a question 
Um, so before we maybe we'll conclude with talking about your programs, um, Catherine Allen says, what is the story of Nagasaki after the bomb? Uh, you mean uh, what happened in Nagasaki because of the I bomb? Think, I think that's the question. What is the story of Nagasaki after the bomb? In other words, so how was Nagasaki compared to Hiroshima? Yes, well, she says. One of the things that's very intense about Nagasaki is that um, the bomb was actually stronger, but it killed fewer people because they missed the middle of the city. They dropped it in a valley. So what happened is uh, this crew came flying along. This is a Christian crew, except for one Jewish guy. They're flying along and they are thinking, oh no, we're not gonna be able to drop this bomb because the place is covered with clouds. And they were under strict orders not to drop the bomb anywhere that they could not see the ground. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden a, a big hole opened up in the clouds and they looked down and they saw a Mitsubishi factory so they decided to drop the bomb there and did. And as a result, they killed the largest Christian community in Japan. Not only that, but they killed mostly um, Catholics. Uh, this was a Catholic community that had been kicked out of um, Hiroshima for not abiding by or not going to the Shinto shrines when they were supposed to, you know, they refused to go to Shinto shrines. So they were kicked out of the valley. And as a result, they were sitting in this Urakami Valley and the uh, plane from a Christian country comes over, finds a hole, drops the bomb and kills many. I mean, you know, most of the people in that valley were killed. So this was a very intense um, something to deal with for the Christians in Hiroshima. I mean, in, in Nagasaki, the, uh, the Shinto, a lot of the people actually said to them, see, your God doesn't do you any good. If you had been worshiping our God, this wouldn't have happened to you. So this was a um, you know, very intense, uh, let's say, religious problem in Nagasaki that had nothing like that happened in Hiroshima. But uh, my friend, I have a good friend who said that the meaning of the bomb in Hiroshima is that we have to give up war. The meaning of the bomb in Nagasaki is we have to give up religious competition. Wow. That's tremendous. Ray, I see you nodding your head. Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think there's a very interesting um, Christian dimension to the legacy of Nagasaki. There's more of a sense of martyrdom than in a lot of um, the Hibakusha testimonials. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's always been like, uh, like playing second hand to Hiroshima. Hiroshima is usually like the main, you know, on um, point of focus. And Nagasaki always comes a little second. And I think part of it is that Hiroshima became the city of peace. And, and Nagasaki became the city of, uh, of like internationalism, I think, Steve, is that, is that correct? Yeah, and prayer, peace and prayer, prayer they say too. Yeah, so um, even now there's, there's, there's um, a little bit of a competition between the two. And I think it's, it's, it's always a shame that Nagasaki isn't as recognized as, as Hiroshima for, for what happened there. And, and actually Nagasaki, well, I, I, I should, Ray was referring to the fact that Nagasaki was the really the only city that was open during the 300 years that Japan was closed to the rest of the world. Nagasaki was open, so it had a large community of foreigners living there for hundreds of years where they weren't living elsewhere in Japan. So there were people from Europe, uh, especially Catholic, uh, missionaries and all. And there were people from China and Korea and elsewhere. So they have uh, a much more developed and a, a deeper feeling about being international than most places in Japan. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. Okay, so I'm just looking. I don't see any additional questions. So why don't we, um, why don't we conclude with uh, talking a little bit about the programs that you offer, both online and when the pandemic is over afterwards. I mean, I, I'm still, like I said, really deeply moved by this presentation um, and the visceral experience of it. So really, thank you. 
Um, Let me go first because I'm going to be really quick. Okay, Ray. Sure. The, sure. Um, what I our peace culture village. The idea was to explore what is peace culture. In other words, what does that actually mean? And uh, so we came up with a place, and in this place, we are to be exploring inner peace. You know, what is it that brings peace to you and how do you be peaceful with people around you and how do we be peaceful with nature this is a really important concept because the way we're doing agriculture now is not sustainable and we have to learn how to get along with the planet we're living on so we are doing that however last year because of the virus all of our tours and camps were or canceled. This year, because of the virus, we have no tours and camps. So basically, nothing is happening there at the moment. So that's the end of that. All of our, all of our tours of Hiroshima are now online. And, uh, so before we switch to Ray, I just want to comment on that. Um, in the song that, that Ray shared from the, the uh, nursery schoolers, I was touched by, they said, make, you know, um, including peace includes the insects and the animals. Yeah. So I really, that, that's, um, it's a very special component. Um, when my kids culture. first came to Hiroshima in, um, in, when they were like eight or nine years old, one of the first questions they were asked is, what's your favorite insect? And they had no idea <laughs> what to say to that. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you. Okay, Ray, go ahead. So yeah, like similar to Steve, like all our programs are online right now. Actually, uh, my organization, Steve's organization are collaborating. We just created this amazing three session module. So the first session has me and one of Steve's staff members kind of giving us a virtual tour of Hiroshima that uses a lot of interesting cutting edge on VR, like on uh, what do you call it, AI generated on uh, pictures and things like that. So it's really high tech, and really kind of cool. Uh, and, and from there, we move on to Steve and he uh, gives a Q&A session with a, with a Hibakusha live on, from Hiroshima. So Steve is completely bilingual. He translates and he ans answers questions. So that gives uh, students or others like a closer view of, of the horrors of the atomic bomb. And the last session includes this amazing really like a therapist who looks at the cultural elements of resiliency in Hiroshima and then asks the participants to apply that to their own lives. So it's like a three session workshop, the theme is resiliency. And the idea is that uh, because of the times we're living in, a great example to get through adversity is what the people of Hiroshima did after the atomic bomb and, and, on, and the resiliency that they showed. And in terms of our in-person in programs, um, you know, I actually, my, my expertise is actually in the Middle East, and we started bringing Middle Eastern participants there about five years ago, and realized that it's such a special place and such an amazing place to do peace programs that we expanded our programs around the world. And the other really big driving factor was that the best part of our program is when our participants talk to the Hibakusha, and they're, and they're so powerful, but the average age for the Hibakusha is 83 now. So within 10 years, so many of these amazing people are gonna be gone. So there's a rush to try to expose the Hibakusha to as many people around the world as possible. So um, we, we expanded our programs outside of the Middle East to America, to South Korea, to uh, Northern Ireland, like all over the world now. Uh, unfortunately, COVID came, but we're hoping that to redo these programs again, probably in the fall or late summer of this year. And, um, and this includes uh, kind of like private tours too. So uh, just people that are really interested in peace or want to apply the lessons of Hiroshima to their own, to their own lives. We kind of run uh, t uh, study tours for the private sector as well. So, so please contact us. All right, that's terrific. You know, I, I really appreciate that again. And, and when here in the US um, with MLK being such a such an important figure, the way that you two educated us and shared us uh, with us, the the um, the crossover, if you will, um, it's incredibly powerful and great for us to know. And I think that over time, the more we share this, uh, 
the more we can learn more lessons in, in a collaborative way that we're really all in this together uh, to, to Steve's slide initially, which said, you know, it didn't just happen to one city, it happened to all of us. So I really wanna thank you, um, Ray and Steve for joining us and for an excellent presentation. Um, if you'd like to uh, public reach out to them for more information, you can reach Ray at raymat at ume.org. That's R-A-Y-M-A-T at ume.org. And you can reach Steve at steve at peaceculturevillage.org. That's steve at peaceculturevillage.org. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. And um, thank you, everyone, for who attended. We really appreciate your time today. Be well, stay safe, wear your mask, and uh, wash your hands frequently. <laughs> OK, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.